Hello, this is Hank McGurk with a uh, reading from the book Behold a Pale Horse by William Cooper. This is from chapter 16. It's the story of Jonathan May. The story of Jonathan May. Jonathan May attempted to break free from the shackles of the Federal Reserve by creating an alternate banking system with instruments backed by land, raw minerals, mineral deposits, oil, coal, timber, and other wilderness holdings. Jonathan aided Gover Governor Connolly and the Hunt brothers in their effort to corner the silver market. The silver would have been used to, quote, Bank of Texas, issue of, quote, real money. This would have destroyed the Federal Reserve had the hunts been successful. When the world bankers realized what was happening, they destroyed Connolly, the Hunt brothers, Jonathan May, and Texas. The Federal Reserve entrapped Mr. May by intentionally routing his credit instruments through the Federal Reserve against the terms clearly stated upon those instruments instead of through Mr. May's alternate system. Jonathan May was illegally arrested, illegally tried, and illegally imprisoned in a federal prison at Terre Haute, Indiana. The world power structure has stolen Mr. May's idea, which will be used as the banking system of the New World Order and is known as the World Conservation Bank. Jonathan has served four years of the 15-year sentence. Now the following are the words of Jonathan May in his affidavit called uh, Telling Time, July 27, 1990. He testifies, I swear by Almighty God the evidence I now give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, to the best of my knowledge, belief, and recollection. I do so swear under the penalty of perjury under the laws of the United States and America, so help me God. I was born into a privileged lifestyle in North Devon, England, the third and last child and only son of a wealthy landowning family. I was privately educated and left school early, determined to join my father's business and not be encumbered with the authoritarian atmosphere of school. I did so by getting myself expelled. I was, I believe, nearly 16. At once, I began to work as a livestock broker, as my father and his family did, and still does. I also farmed. I then branched into other goods, buying for customers using my contacts to supply items at a lower cost and better quality items at the same cost than normal retail suppliers. I was very successful. My business continued to expand. Management was highly vertically structured, and diversification was lateral as I could possibly make it. It continued to thrive. I develop a sophisticated tax shelter system, which was lawfully capable of removing taxation liability from the majority of my own and my colleagues' businesses. At age 20, in my 21st year, numerous documents, family heirlooms from my mother's side of the family were given to me as its last remaining male heir. Among these old documents was an indenture issued to an ancestor of mine settling upon him and his heir assigns in perpetuity for the duration of the term hereof the responsibility and authority of trustee for certain property, goods, chattels, etc. As far as I can recall, the document was dated in this year of our Lord, 1647. This document, a parchment with the royal seal of England still attached, constituted a trust indenturing my ancestor, etc., for a 999-year term as trustee for the property named. The parchment was signed by King, excuse me, by Charles Stuart Rex of England, France, and Ireland, King Charles I. Knowing nothing about such matters, I consulted lawyers. They determined that the document was genuine, that a trust had been established by British King Charles I, and that its original trustee had been my ancestor, and that, as a matter of law, it could not be broken. The British monarch then, and still, being the supreme head of the judiciary in the United Kingdom. Also, as a matter of law, the trust was an operative entity under the provisions of which I, as the remaining male heir, was the responsible trustee. However, it had clearly been an operative for as long as anyone could remember. Shares certified from the Delhi and Punjab Railway and other such antiquated relics 
seemingly unredeemed still, were with the Trust Charter. Successive charters endorsed by successive British monarchs were with the original one as well. It was determined that subtrusts, subsidiaries, should be formed at once under the grandfathering precepts of the original 17th century charter. Out of the air, I decided that 4,000 such subsidiaries would be formed as uh, non-domiciled entities governed under the plural and simultaneous governments of all of the nations of the world which were non-communist. Between the months of September 19, 1969 and February 15, 1970, these 4,000 charters were printed and recorded in a register. These were numbered, prefixed by number SSR slash 647 slash. The first was chosen to be the common trustee entity for the remaining 3,999. None could be recorded in any one country. Doing so would have given the country of registration some prior claim taxation ability. For this reason, the register of 4,000 entities was kept in constant custody of myself as the recorded sole signature of record of the original trust, which we named, quote, the International Equity Trust, end quote. We decided to call the group of subtrusts the Sovereign Charter Trust Group. This main group was then subdivided into the Solitis Trust Group, comprised of administrative in-house members whose activities were to be coordinated by and through a board of directors known as the trustee directorate body. The remaining trusts were to have been sold or leased as tax shelters to sundry third parties for a fee of 20% of the total tax liability saved by the client using the trust for this purpose, i.e., without one of our trusts, a tax liability of 100000 but with one of our trusts at the cost of the client for $20,000, a nil tax liability. In 1969, lawyers advised us the only problem we faced was the taxation authority's propensity to arbitrarily state that our trusts were a non-entity, but that they would be protected from taxation anywhere worldwide by legislation once proof positive was available that they had been alive as artificial persons for 12 years. My local hometown lawyer counter-endorsed the register under every page, and the 4,000 trusts were born, i.e. chartered, between September 19, 1969 and February 15, 1970. Accordingly, I determined that I should continue my business enterprises for another 12 years and then simply sell or lease out the 399 trusts, or 3,999 trusts, at either a flat fee or by the 20% of taxes saved formula and use the proceeds in part to redetermine the what, where, why, and when concerning the assets of the original trust. During the years that followed, I became more and more diversified and made sound commercial contacts all over the globe. Increasingly, my fees and commissions were being paid me in differing currencies. This brought my attention to their differing interest rates and who, in fact, it is who determines which currencies are loaned at which rates. I discovered that a minute cartel controlled all banking policies worldwide and that the provision or non-provision of, quote, money was all controlling. As my reputation as a finder of the unusual at a fair price grew, I, with my colleagues, began to realize that there was considerable resistance throughout the conventional financial markets to, quote, entrepreneurs. Highly determined but very independently mined individuals were not at all welcome in normal banking circles. There was a very real need in the independent business communities throughout the world for alternative credit facilities to properly and fairly provide for entrepreneurial needs, a window in the market for them between new venture capital and dyed-in-the-wool conventional business capital. We decided that, in a wholly novel and independent matter, our loosely connected but highly respected circle of middlemen would become providers of capital before our established clients all over the world. Independent credit capital sources in the Middle East and elsewhere, and several substantial private placement arrangements were made, first between ourselves and our investors, and subsequently between ourselves and the user of those investments. We chose to, to take a minimal intermediary fee, but retain a non-working but joint venture profit sharing interest in many of the inter enterprises capitalized by our investors. We did find that there were never enough investors to be found. Otherwise, everyone seemed content. 
Like many arrogant and foolish men before me, I tended to advertise my financial success. I grew headstrong. The local small-town police force began to watch me and became a significant nuisance, stopping me for tires, speeding, etc., etc. I started a butcher business and again made a significant success of it, also in my hometown area. My success meant the loss of trade by, any co by my competition. My premises were burgled successively, and soon insurers would not insure me. I provided my own deterrent. I rigged a loaded shotgun sign outside of my preference, uh, premises, and inside the cold store placed a very lifelike loaded shotgun and trip alarm system for anyone thinking again of stealing my property as uninsured thousands had already been stolen. The local police arrested me for setting a man trap with intent, intent to danger life. My intent, quite obviously, was to protect my property, so I was very properly acquitted of this foolish charge against me. Having been advised not to rig up any such device again, I purchased a young mountain lion as a guard dog to continue to dissuade any would-be thieves. But 2020 hindsight, I realized it was not an appropriate thing to do. I began to be a minor celebrity in my little country town, and the local police were thoroughly incensed that the charges against me had been dropped. I had become something of a target. My high profile was not working for me. By this time, because of my monitoring offenses and the publicity resulting from the trial in the mountain lion, my family all but disowned me. I made it my business to establish exactly who it was in the local police force who was investigating my problems. It was no lesser than Inspector Goldsworthy. I hired people to watch his activities, and it came out that he was involved with drug and The information supplied to me that was that uh, Goldworthy had an aged mother in Plymouth, England, whom he used an excuse to make frequent trips there from North Devon, but in fact he was met there by individuals who were delivering illegal drugs to him. There was no way of establishing for certain if, this, if such was the case. The people I had been paying to follow him were not professionals. I felt it was time to hand the matter over into professional hands, though, and I did so. Almost at once, this particular inspector left the North Devon area. Word came back to me from different sources, probably the result of one of the two people I had employed to follow Goldworthy, talking carelessly, that Goldworthy's subordinates on the local police force were going to get even. The harassment grew to overwhelming proportions. For example, a hunting trip with authorized shotguns locked in my car under a blanket in the back seat became, quote, having a loaded shotgun in a public place, end quote. Was one of my guns left loaded? It would have been the first and only time. Can the inside of my locked car be, quote, a public place, end quote? But my car was inside a public car park, so the court upheld the conviction. The next two experiences originated with a friend who subsequently admitted to me that he had agreed to doing two things in return for not being prosecuted by the same local police force. He sold me a dinghy and gave me a pair of boots. Both were stolen property, and I was convicted of stealing and receiving them respectively. Fines were imposed. I realized finally that I had no prospect of leading a civilized life in my birthplace, so I left the UK and came to the US to try and establish a new, unsullied life. Between 1980 and 1984, I simply made contacts and conducted no business beyond consultancy. I generated little money for myself. I lived for the most part on the money I'd made in Europe during the 70s. I was in the process of suing my local bank, Barclays Bank, for multiple contraventions of the Banking Act when I left England. One of the, quote, enemies I had made in England was a solicitor who had given me very bad advice and then had the effrontery to charge me for it. He was a close friend of my local bank manager. During my absence from England, he sent me a bill for about $2,000 of final demand and then obtained a judgment order and a personal bankruptcy order, all without my knowledge until I returned some five months later. I am certain it was done to thwart my lawsuit against Mrs. Barclays Bank. And this is MSSRS.Barclays Bank, so I'm not sure exactly what. In England, once a judge bankrupt, one may not sustain any lawsuits at all. I immediately left England again and rearranged all my assets so that I was not in violation of the UK bankruptcy laws. I also obtained a U.S. visa for business purposes.
1983 or 1984, the trustee of the Sovereign Charter Trust Group was recorded as a client of the Oklahoma Trust Company, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Rand Everest, CEO. It had become necessary to become more visible within the U.S. Little, if any, business was done with Oklahoma, save using it as a depository for some of the Salitis Trust Group private placement commercial paper. Outside of the jurisdiction of the Securities Exchange Commission, exclusively upon a private placement basis, the International Equity Trust began at this time to place its paper in commercial situations worldwide. Professional third-party geologists determined by core testing and the actual assayed content of the nine sections of gold, silver containing properties conveyed, bartered, and assigned unseverably to the Sovereign Charter Trust Group in 1980-81 to consistently down to the assayed depth of 160 feet was a minimum of one half ounce of gold per ton uh, by cubic yard and up to 10 ounces of silver per ton uh, cubic yard over the entire nine square miles and beyond. Geological surveys confirmed that these properties and the acreage adjoining had once been a significantly large lake fed by numerous streams from the Rocky Mountains. Over the millennia, considerable quantities of gold and silver had been washed down into the lake bed. Under the Equal Rights Doctrine, the very cornerstone of the national heritage of the United States of America, with these nine square miles worth of gold and silver deposits, the Sovereign Charter Trust Group was endowed with a very considerable portfolio of assets. The determination was made that the physical worth of those assets congruent to and parallel to comparable entities in the public sector would be used via the production of a commercial private placement paper to generate liquidity of a sufficiency to establish the wholly independent credit facility needed throughout the secondary financial market to fill the, quote, middleman's window in that market. Between 1982 and 1986, a considerable volume of face value, long-term maturity paper, private placement, quote, prime capital notes, end quote, was issued by the International Equity Trust for and on behalf of the seven trusts which own the aforesaid gold and silver deposits. An ultra-conservative system of checks and balances was instituted by the directorate members of the International Equity Trust under the chairmanship and CEO authority of the undersigned. Further applying the Equal Rights Doctrine of the United States to our private placement policy, I and my colleagues determined that in order to properly reflect the value of the gold and silver we had acquired it, was necessary to establish a minimum possible value and use it in our representative maximum benchmark. This way, there could ever be any question of misrepresentation instituted against us. In order to further insulate ourselves from any such charge, we determined that our, quote, paper, end quote, was to present itself only upon a private placement basis and throughout its, quote, life, end quote, in the secondary market. Both safety features were built into our private placement issue of paper as irrevocable and unconditional prerequisites of, the, of its issue. The International Equity Trust, in its capacity as a plenty potential, potential fidu, fiduciary trustee for the Salidus Trust Group, the administrative in-house members of the Sovereign Trust Group, was and is the only authorized issuer of the group's private placement prime capital notes. Such issue may not occur in any circumstance save and except that the seven asset-owning trusts into whose custodial possession the group assets are all placed independently agree, each through their sole guardianship or signatures, that each issuance is appropriate and acceptable. Such independently arrived at and mandatory unanimous agreement to so issue must be confirmed in writing by each of the seven trusts sole guardian or signatures of record and issued to the International Equity Trust in official memorandum format before such private placement paper may be issued. The circumstance of issuance was so made properly accountable. The face value of the paper was likewise, likewise properly and strictly controlled. The Sovereign Charter Trust Group's asset base, initially the aforesaid gold and silver deposit, and subsequently also real property comprising over 517,000 thousand acres, surface and minerals, would and shall never, under the terms of the unseverable policy of the Sovereign Charter Trust Group's senior administrative decision-making body, the governing chapter, may be encumbered 
by debt beyond one quarter volume. That means that for each certified $100 of the asset base, no more than $25 of face value private placement paper may be in existence. The reasoning behind this very conservative policy was and is that the ultimate credit facility, which was being prepared for in the early 80s with the issuance of paper and the accumulation of assets was to never find itself overextended. An unquestioned and unquestionable safety feature ever present within each facet of the new facility was that none of its component parts would ever be in a position of insolvency. <clears throat> now, for administrative purposes, three differently captioned documents documentary instruments were used. Each was a private placement promissory note. Each constituted a zero coupon instrument, i.e. a promise to pay a final due date figure in the future comprised of both the principal sum and the interest thereon accrued. All three instruments were to as, quote, prime capital notes, end quote, but one was also called a, quote, bill of exchange, end quote, and a quote, notice of acceptance, end quote, and as far as I can remember, an, quote, indenture, end quote. Bills of exchange were used when the recipient's business need was simply to increase their asset base now in exchange for equity in such business in perpetuity. Notices of acceptance were used in situations where the recipient's business need was both to increase their asset base and to become affiliated with a member or a member within the Sovereign Charter Trust Group by placing such business and or its owners within the framework of one of the group's trusts. Indentures were used exclusively on an in-house basis among the various members, associates, and affiliates of the Salidas Trust Group. The, the formula determined by the directorate body of trustees was as follows. Asset Base 100 Paper but liability maximum aggregate at 25 equals a AAA rating. The asset base at 100 with a paper liability maximum aggregate at 33 equals a AA rating. Asset base 100 where paper liability maximum aggregate is at 50%, or rather at 50, is an A rating. Asset base 100, paper liability maximum aggregate at 66 equals uh, D rating. The private rating of our associates and affiliate business en entities began at the beginning of 1986. Our own group's paper was mandated by group policy and determined by the governing chapter never to exceed an exposure factor of 25% of the group's in-house assets i.e. the assets owned by the Salidas Trust Group's seven primary members and was accordingly qualified by our International Finance Council L uh, Limited as a private placement AAA rated promissory note. In 1984, one portion of our gold reserves was exchanged in an asset barter exchange agreement with the sole surviving owner of over 517,000 acres of real property, surface, and mineral. The group's acquisition of such property was made unseverable under the provisions of Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the United States Constitution. Excuse me. After such acquisition, the net worth of the slightest trust group by and through said seven primary Grade 1 member trust was estimated as follows. A note. Some further 11 section of the same gold-bearing property was being disputed at the time and therefore not counted although a defendable title uh, there too was and is held. Number one, nine sections square miles times 640 acres times 48,840 48, square yards per acre times 53 yards, which is the 160-foot depth, was 1,477,555,200 cubic yards. 2. 1,477,555,200 cubic yards times 1 half ounce equals 
738,777,600 ounces of gold in the nine square miles. 3. 738,777,600 ounces. 6 million assigned in exchange for the 517,000 acres equals... 732,777,600 ounces of gold. 4. 732,777,600 at, say, $250 per ounce equals 183,194,400,000. 517,000 acres at, say, $500 per acre is 258,500,000. high-grade low-sulfur coal at, say, $10 per is 11 billion oil, gas, and timber reserves not reckoned, totaling 194,452,900,000 dollars. By June 18, 1986, liabilities outstanding inclusive of notes at uh, 12 to 13 billion was approximately 14,375 million for a grand total of 180,077,900,000. On this basis, I made representations to parties before June 18, 1986 that the International Equity Trust controlled assets in excess of 152 billion. It did, and it still does. This report concerns those assets' ability to properly reinstate the power and authority of Congress to govern without deference to those whom it presently owes the national debt and its life. On June 18, 1986, at the invitation of attorney Ms. Wendy Allison Knorr, an ex-recorder who had been forced to resign from her position in the state of Wisconsin according to her subsequent disclosure to me, and for, for and on behalf of not less than 40 of the sovereign charter trust groups trusts including the seven who own the nine square miles of gold and silver reserves and the 517,000 acres the international equity trust purchased the laquai parl bank corporation incorporated said entity was and is authorized under section 255.4 of 12 cfr to quote act as a bank buy and sell securities, underwrite insurance, municipal bonds, and commercial paper, etc. This holding company owned and owns a financial entity named the State State Bank of Boyd. Technically, the State Bank of Boyd, Minnesota, was declared closed as a bank by the Federal Reserve System in 1984. On March 31, 1986, the Minnesota State Supreme Court ruled that the State Bank of Boyd was not in liquidation nor in bankruptcy but rather that its assets and liabilities had only been sold to the Bank of Mat- Madison, which later changed its name to the Laquai Parle Bank. Note, this is not to be confused with the Laquai Parle Bank Corporation, Incorporated. You guys will have to excuse my parakeets. When I, when I talk, they like to talk. Highly unconventionally, but not unlawfully, as soon as we purchased Laquai Parle Bank Corporation, Incorporated, Ours, it was the recipient of a Salinas Trust Group's promissory note due and payable from memory on August 1, 1999 in the figure of $2 billion with a minimum yield factor included therein, a zero coupon note, which provided a then current value of approximately $1,672,000. A part of the acquisition contract whereby the International Equity Trust purchased the holding company and its wholly owned subsidiary the State Bank of Boyd, was that under the aforesaid provisions of 12 CFR Section 255.4, the holding company at once and thereby extended a $1,200,000,000 
line of credit to the subsidiary under the strict understanding that said subsidiary was under the direct supervision of its parent entity, the Kwai Parle Bank Corporation Incorporated, and through its owner's trustee, the International Equity Trust. The first and foremost directive was that the State Bank of Boyd enjoyed a strictly limited authorization only as the service agent of its parent to extend credit only up to an aggregate figure of 87 and a half or seven eighths of the credit extended to it by its parent, i.e. one billion fifty million or of the one billion two hundred thousand million. The State Bank of Boyd was closed down as a bank. It was not a non-viable corporate entity. It was not, quote, defunct, end quote. It did not have a banking charter, despite its fact that Attorney Nora confirmed that the Minnesota State Commissioner of Commerce, that she took the legal and that it was, quote, in our possession constructively as a matter of law, end quote. I took the position that, since the purpose of the Sovereign Charter Trust Group's acquisition of the Kwai Parle Bank Corporation was primarily to outwit and outmaneuver the private owners of the Federal Reserve System and provide an alternative credit system for the peoples and their governments of the world outside of their manipulative controlled climate, we would not presume to overtly contravene the Minnesota State Banking Authorities, but rather use the State Bank of Boyd and its only corporate status as the service agent for the Laquai Parle Bank Corporation Incorporated, which was itself authorized by legislation to, quote, act as a bank. And the alternative credit facility, which was presented to the directorate body of the International Equity Trust by our think tank, was, in my esti- estimation, nothing short of After some deliberation, we decided to refer to our new copyrighted system as the, quote, re-economy system, end quote. The re-economy system is comprised of a series of individual self-help socioeconomic programs. As far as memory serves me, a total of 170 different programs were developed. The re-economy program restricts itself to two separate functions. One is the provision of the interest-exempt credit facilities for private business users. The other is for the provision of limited, non-repayable grant facilities for which we chose to regard as, quote, critical need, and quote, areas of survival, e.g. the homeless, drug and alcohol abuse victims, low-income students, and schools and universities which receive no federal funds. These were and are national programs. During the late summer of 1985, the International Equity Trust was approached by a few of the debtor nations. They were complaining bitterly that the owners of the banks, particularly in the U.S., to which their countries were indebted, through the International Monetary Fund, were calling for revisions and amendment to those nations' constitutions to better accommodate the corporate associations of those bank owners and those corporations' designs to establish operations within the nation's concern. For those of you who are not aware, it is generally agreed within informed circles that the presidency of James Earl Carter was orchestrated and primarily paid for in campaign funds by various, quote, inner circle, end quote, members of the Trilateral Commission. After the effective power and authority of the Federal Reserve System was shifted from Washington, D.C. Board of Directors to the so-called independent shareholders of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, the voting shareholders of which in controlling proportion are all coincidentally members of the tri- Trilateral Commission. Jimmy Carter endorsed Paul Volcker's fractional re- reserve lending policy. It alone became the root cause of the inflation recession and asset growth sales collateral cycles, which, if you examine the statistics, are orchestrated in four yearly trends. Fractional reserve lending and exclusive ability of only Federal Reserve member institutions is wholly and solely responsible for the fact that the nation's money supply and circulation is in fact comprised of over 97% credit for which nowhere on earth has there ever existed the printed currency equivalent. It was fractional reserve lending which was swiftly instituted immediately before high-ranking U.S. government officials persuaded the Nigerian Prime Minister to increase the price of Nigerian crude oil, which he did, 
immediately prior to losing his life in a coup which was orchestrated by U.S. covert paramilitary personnel trained in Belize, uh, which was then British Honduras. The Nigerian prime minister's la life lasted, quote, coincidentally, end quote, until U.S. officials had flown on to Kuwait and provided and persuaded its oil producers to sell their oil at the inflated price of $30 per barrel. Why were these astute U.S. emissaries prepared to purchase the Arabs' oil at this hugely inflated price? The answer is both awesome and terrifying. U.S. government officials were prepared and authorized to agree to purchase the oil from the Persian Gulf states and the United Arab Emirates upon two seemingly innocuous conditions. The first condition was that OPEC, which was to have so much anti-Arab propaganda spewed up against it later, was to become a reality and to insist that all oil sales worldwide were in the future to be dollar denominated. The second and more sinister condition foisted upon the unsuspecting Arabs was the U.S. soil, or rather, excuse me, the U.S. oil companies purchasing the crude would not remit the sales proceeds back to the Middle East. Rather, the Arabs were invited as a prerequisite of sale at the inflated price to purchase long-term 20- and 30-year certificates of deposit locked into their depositor banks. Now, note, readers are strongly invited to investigate, as did investigators with our, in our group, the, uh, quote, coincidental, end quote, relationships between the owner-controllers of the purchasing oil companies and the owner-controllers of the banks from which the Arabs, quote, chose, end quote, to purchase their 20- and 30-year CDs. In simplest terms, what is this fractional reserve lending? As evidenced by the fact that the money in circulation cannot be matched with currency in existence, save in a negative ratio of about 66.6 .6 to 1, it is a fraud. Can you lend anyone a dollar if 66.6% or cents of it has never been coined? The answer is yes, if you were a member of the Federal Reserve System and not a humble licensee. In order to evaluate the extent of the fraud at of fractional reserve lending as a matter of law, it is time to examine the corruption practices against we the people of the U.S. as the result of its operation. Let us look at the tiny example of OPEC slash U.S. prime bank scenario. An oil company issues a check for $1 million to an Arab seller stateside agent. The figures are crossed out of the oil company's account at, say, Chase Manhattan, and inserted into a 30-year certificate of deposit in the Arab's name on the computer. The Arab has been paid. Who then owns Standard Oil? Who then owns Chase Manhattan? What happens next? The crude is refined. The costs and profits are passed on to the U.S. public. That, quote, dirty Arab cartel, end quote, is blamed. But at $2 per gallon is the oil company's account, which receives the revenue. Meanwhile, what is happening to the Arabs' account? It shows $1 million. In fact, the bank, in our example, Chase Manhattan, has deposited that $1 million, a piece of paper with $1 million written on it, to the Federal Reserve Clearing System, which, quote, pursuant to fractional reserve lending policy, end quote, authorizes Chase Manhattan to loan at, quote, times 60, end quote, 60 million to Mexico, Brazil, and the U.S. Congress, whoever it pleases, promulgating the overwhelming falsehood that there is too much currency in the market and not enough buyer, uh, borrowers. Consequently, the U.S. Congress purportedly owes approximately $65 million per week for the next uh, 2,000 years, providing that as of now, not one further dime is ever spent and there is a 2,000-year moratorium on all interest charges to Congress. It is, uh, its second is the United Arab Emirates being paid about 7% per $1 million in oil revenue. And those trusted pillars of society, the Federal Reserve members, for every $1 million recorded due in about 25 years to the Arabs has been the burden of paying that er Arab about $70,000 per year and is only making from the White House a staggering $6 million per year and requiring at the same time $60 million per year as repayment because of trilateral originated policy issued by Congress. We owe all this to the kind fiscal servants of America and her people. In 1912, 
400 million was owed to Congress, and today, 6 trillion 500 billion is owed by Congress. A radical I am not. A one time farmer and now forever branded criminal, permanently humbled in awe of the extent of the above evidenced megalomania I am. I terminated my business in England in about 1978. Soon afterwards, I was terminated from being an individual with anyone with whom anyone could conduct business in England as a result of the warped and crippled mind of a banker and his stooge. I was invited to America by American strangers from Texas. They will have their own horror stories to tell. They never will. Their lives are at stake. Suffice it to say that they, Mr. John Connolly, since bankrupted, Governor Clements, now about to be ousted by the same force, the Shah of Iran, whose illness became authentic only after arriving in protective custody at a U.S. Air Force base, a German banker, also assassinated by persons trained in British, British Honduras, and an, Amer an Austrian industrialist, now pronounced insane, were all involved in the silver fiasco. Why? To properly authenticate Texan and U.S. currency backed with 371 one quarter grains of silver per ounce as the unrepealed money of account laws decree. I learned these true horror stories after I had rejoiced in my now proven to have been asinine belief in the U.S. Constitution. On June 18, 1986, in my recorded capacity as sole signature for record of the International Equity Trust and its lawful capacity as a sole trustee of record for the 399 or 3,999 other trusts grandfathered under and as subtrusts of them. Authentic trust established only when the law of force of arms existed on the North American continent. Trust which wholly supersedes taxation anywhere. I sign an agreement constituting, quote, obligations of contract, end quote. I knew they could not be impaired. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of your Constitution decrees it. The International Equity Trust so purchased that the bank holding company, quote, authorized to extend credit nationally and not internationally, end quote, not for itself, but for 40 trusts, none of the other 39, which had any idea that the others were likewise buying, thereby defeating the Federal Reserve's controlling policy to obtain its permission to so purchase. Of those 40 trusts was the Sovereign Trust of North America. As a matter of public record, recorded under the provisions of Article 4, Section 1, which mandates such fact to be given full faith and credit, the beneficiaries of the Southern, Sovereign Trust of North America include the U.S. Congress, each state of the Union's governments, and the body politic, we the people of the United States. Other trust beneficiaries are other non-commune uh, governments, governments. And note, please examine public records number uh, 2401094 and 2406334 in Ramsey County, Minnesota, about 300 pages. If you were told no such record exists, please contact the undersigned who will inform you where the preserved certified copies thereof are located. A declaratory statement dated between June 18, 1986 and July 3, 1986, was sent to Mr. Paul Volcker, then chairman of the Board of the Directors of the Federal Reserve System. In it, issued and signed by me in my capacity aforesaid, I disclosed to him that our group had allocated a quantum of 500,000 million per U.S. state for the impl implementation of our United States re-economy system, not as a competitor per se, but rather as a sophisticated alternative credit source whose purpose was entirely limited to its prospective outlets. The phone number of the attorney, Nora, was enclosed with a clear and un unequivocal request to contact us in the event that our program was in any way in contravention of the unit of the Constitution and laws made on pursuance thereto, in which it relied for its authenticity upon the same laws which permitted the Federal Reserve to enforce its policies. 
Because our holding company was in part owned by the U.S., this constituted it as an independent agent of the United States under Title 18, U.S.C. Section 6. We unconditionally covenanted to Congress an equity participation of a minimum of $750 million per month to each state and an anticipated $40 million, a certain $35 million per month, and to the body politic, we the people, on a state-by-state -state basis of about $150 million per month. The balance of the income generated monthly saved 5% operating expenses and a 10% fee belonged in perpetuity to the investors, whose assets backed our facility in a minimum ratio in our favor of times 3 in assets and 8 sevenths in terms of our 12 CFR Section 225.4 Authorized U.S. Bank Holding Company Service Agents Maximum Possible Liabilities. On June 19, 1986, having so purchased the LaCroix-Paul Bank Corporation out of the future control of the Federal Reserve System in order to shore up its status as an authorized U.S. bank holding company, another banking entity owned by the International Equity Trust was assigned under the LaCroix-Paul Bank Corporation Incorporated ownership. The, a certain amount of cash had been set aside to cover the float, the assets had been duly assigned. The law was clear that we were authorized. Paul Volcker had not come back to us within the ten days under the law of lashes, which I had invoked in my letter. Unconventional or not, we were in business. Certain of our customers were approved for immediate credit lines. Certain of our operatives were appointed as re regional directors over a five-state area each endowed with the responsibility to open 10 offices per state. Each was provided with an interest prepaid credit line of $50 million. Acting service agent, first tier retailer for the LaCroix Parle Bank Corporation's credit extending enterprise, the subsidiary, the State Bank of Boyd, in its own right, also enjoyed a new credit line of $1,200,000 but was obligated not to extend more than seven-eighths, or $1,050,000, to insulate itself from insolvency. With the knowledge that checks are not securities, and are so decreed in the Securities and Exchange Act, an act made in pursuance to the Constitution, and hence, under Article VI, supreme in its force and effect, Attorney Nora ordered cashier's checks and personalized checks from the appropriate printers for the State Bank of Boyd. She and I both knew and later reconfirmed at my trial that there exists no legislation which prohibits anyone or any corporation from issuing its own cashier's checks, per se. Unconventional, without a doubt, but unlawful, no. We both also knew that the only restriction in terms of the State Bank of Boyd's activities as a non-bank was that it was physically without its banking charter, but, as reconfirmed at trial, the only additional ability such a charter grants its corporate power is the authority to take deposits. Neither the re-economy system nor any of its 170 programs engages any of its variously tiered instrumentalities and any deposit taking activity. Reeconomy is an entirely restructured socioeconomic equation. On July 3rd, 1986, in the absence of jurisdiction, in the absence of a valid arrest warrant, in the absolute absence of a matter of law in any crime, I was arrested in Georgia for interstate transportation of falsely made securities. The securities in question, the only securities made the subject matter of the charges against me, were the State Bank of Boyd checks, each one of which was appropriately stamped on the reverse side to be privately cleared outside of the Federal Reserve System. 
Contrary to congressional legislation, I was given no extradition hearing, but was held in Georgia for my removal to Minnesota for arraignment. My arraignment took place contrary to legislated time limit prescription. I was also denied counsel for any uh, I was also denied counsel of my choice. My quote trial, end quote, did not take place within the statutory maximum of 90 days of my continued incarceration from July 3rd, 1986. I was denied permission to have witnesses. My subpoena demands were ignored. Exculpating evidence was precluded. When I attempt to fire my mandatory public defender to better conduct the remainder of the trial myself, I was denied. No one would have, nor, nor one could have lost, when it was our assets at risk, backing our credit, being extended in direct accordance with congressionally instituted legislation and in compliance with 12 CFR section 225.4. When I pointed this out in court and demanded that it be produced, the court refused. It was clear I was to be jailed. My, quote, crimes, end quote, were my foolishness in believing the U.S. Constitution's guarantee of my innocence and my right to equal commercial ability and protection and clearly my arrogance in believing that such constitutional provisions would provide sufficient protection against the now obviously corrupted instruments of the U.S. judicial system. I am a British citizen. I am not a jurisdictional resident of D.C. under... 26 U.S.C. Section 7701A39 or otherwise. The United Nations Convention implements congressional guarantee unto my government that I shall enjoy the full weight of the protection of the laws of the United States. Instead, well beyond the purview of any legislative authority, I was subjected in an Admiralty Jurisdictionary Article I Tribunal called the United States District Court, no constitutionally proper district court of the United States, to a trial for an invented, quote, crime, end quote, that is legislatively impossible to commit. Mr. Harbor, the U.S. Probation Service Congressional Delegate, made a, quote, mistake, end quote, with my sentencing guidelines when he should have been worst possible case 14 to 18 months. He instead provided the court with a 52 to 64 month range. Given the judge's appointment by the trilateral President Carter and the relationship to the Federal Reserve Director, the court quite appropriately, and this is uh, in quotes, or rather, the court quite, quote, appropriately, end quote, sentenced me to 10 years in prison, not to protect the people, but to protect the Federal Reserve's fraud against the people. I so publicly accuse. During the past four years of this sentence, evidence upon evidence of civil and criminal conspiracy has presented to such lofty persons as Senator Joseph Biden, the Eternal Attorney General, the Inspector General, and more, to no avail save continued and continuing abuse of process and overt falsehoods being made part of court records proven to be false by conflicting U.S. government agency source records, where, to whom, one can turn to reign as a human or regain as a human right, a civil right, and both my constitutional and NATO instituted right my freedom. Never was there an intent to defraud, only ever to wrest the people from the chains of a debt, a suffocating government, and her people. So I swear to the absolute best of my knowledge, belief, and recollection, the foregoing is the unadulterated truth. 
the foregoing, entitled, quote, Telling Time, end quote, was duly served by certified mail postage prepaid upon Senator Thurman, Senator Graham, Senator Helms, Congressman Crane, Congressman Hefner, at their respective addresses on Capitol Hill this 30th day of July in 19...